I am a clinical psychologist and I've been in practice in Missoula for uh, 26 years now and I do a lot of work with kids and families. How I tend to interface with the department is um, I do parent-child relationship assessments uh, looking at uh, assessing what the relationship is like, where there are problem areas, what the strengths are to offer some guidance and we try to do that early in the process to help guide intervention. Um, and then I also do therapy sometimes with the family, sometimes doing dyadic work with the parents and kids. I'll let you introduce yourself, Ivy. So I'm Ivy. I'm a therapist of Partnership for Children. As Dennis has mentioned, Partnership for Children um, is a partnership of an uh, agency up in uh, Helena called Intermountain, which um, some of you might be familiar with, and Youth Homes. Um, we get our treatment model from Intermountain and our sort of administrative support from Youth Homes. We are um, a growing agency right now. We have two group homes, uh, six kids per group home, ages 4 to 14. Most of the kids we work with have um, significant abuse, trauma, loss, neglect from the early childhood. Um, there's, I think, some old rumors around that we work primarily with kids with reactive attachment disorder, which is something we do work with, but our span is much greater than that. And then in addition to our two group homes, we have a family care part of our program that does in-home services with foster families, adoptive families, birth families, um, families in the process of um, putting their lives back together and brand new families who are just sort of starting on their journey. So we sort of span across the board. Um, we usually take kids between 4 and 14, so um, usually we're on the younger side, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, as opposed to some of the other youth home services in the community, which tends to take um, slightly older kids, adolescents and teenagers. Okay. Um. Ivy and I haven't quite planned how we're going to do this. We just plan on winging it and chiming in and um, both adding in. So, And feel free to ask questions as we go, make comments, um, so that we can focus more specifically on areas that all of you folks are interested in. I wanted to talk a bit, you know, I think this is a process that can become quite contentious and folks can lose sight of really everybody is working for a common purpose. And I think sometimes it can feel like, um, and it gets conceptualized, like the department is trying to take the kids away and the parents are trying to hang on to the kids and the kids are in the middle with this tug of war. Um, but really I think what everybody wants is to provide the best possible chance for the birth parents to be able to raise the kids that that's the best outcome, that if the, if the birth parents have the capacity to be able to provide good enough parenting for the kids, that's best. And I think everybody is in agreement about that. Um, but just as the process unfolds, people can really lose sight of that and it can feel like they're on opposite sides of the fence. And so I think as CASA workers, you can help facilitate that and remind people of, wait a minute, folks, you know, remember, we're really all working for the same thing here. And th the tricky part is because you're trying to sort out in the process, there are some parents who are not going to be able to provide good enough parenting for their kids. And despite the fact that they really love the kids and want to do that, some parents are just not able to. And so that's kind of what the process is about, is being able to sort that out and figure out, are these parents going to be capable of providing good enough parenting or not? You want to add anything to that? To the no, I'll chime in. I think your outline okay. looks great. Yeah, yeah, just jump in. Okay. You know, something that's helped me in this is to work from the assumption that the parents have good intentions. And sometimes that's hard to see because they've done such terrible things to the kids that we can view them as monsters. And then it can be very difficult to work with somebody that you're perceiving as, as a monster. And while maybe sometimes that's not true that parents are um, 
that they have good intentions. I don't know that I can think of an exception to that, of a parent that I've met, that I've worked with, that that hasn't been true. I think they have good intentions and they get off track. And then getting off track, they get more off track and then more off track and more off track. And that's what you see then when they come to uh, the attention of child and family services. But keeping in mind, they were, they're trying to um, do what's best for the, for the child, I think, can help in, in working with them. Reactions to that? No, would anybody disagree with that? No? No? Okay. The only, the, if, like in cases today, <coughs> it, you, you, you start to wonder because you, you see, because of the circumstances and everything going around, swirling around in their lives, that they seem incapable of really focusing on the child right. or children. And, and it's all about them. And, and it's not like they don't love them or anything, but, right. they, it, but it's their needs first and children's right. needs second, third, or fourth. This is called foreshadowing. <laughs> You're hinting at some things that we're going to be talking about, yes. Yes. Does substance abuse change any of that, or is that part of what you're talking about? Um, I think they still have good intention. That can be part of what gets in the way of them being able to follow through with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yes. Just a, this seems like a silly question, I guess, but I love tell, me what, tell <laughs> me what, tell me what, give me a silly answer here. What, what do you think of as good enough parenting that, that I, I haven't really... It'll See, th this is my B. What like is good enough parenting? parenting? Yes. <laughs> good enough. Good right. And that, that's B here. What is good enough parenting? It's, it's kind of an elusive subject because there's not common consensus about that. You know, there's not um, agreement in the field of here it is. You've got to have these five things, and if you do these five things, that's good enough parenting. It's somewhat subjective. So in doing these evals for the department, I tried to outline, you know, looking at what the research is, can we try to pin this down a bit of what is good enough parenting? That we're not looking at what's optimal parenting, but just th that minimum standard of what's necessary to give kids a good enough start in life. And again, it, it's pretty subjective about where you put that line. And that's where I think there can be lots of arguing in court about disagreement about where that line is. Is this what you equate with best interest of the child? Right. Because that's what we're supposed to be looking at. Right. Not yeah. good enough parenting, but best interest of child. So that's your way of phrasing, if they can do this. That's the best. That's, Th the, best that's the best. And, and I guess it's kind of coming at this from the idea that it's best for them to be raised by their birth parents if the birth parents can do good enough parenting, but there's this point at which being with their birth parents, that provides some benefit, but if they're not able to do a good enough job, then that overrides the benefit of being with their parent. And that's where there's controversy of where exactly is that point where it shifts. So what I'm going to, yes? Have you never encountered a parent that you as sadistic or um, pathological? As sadistic yeah. or pathological? You know, I don't know that I, I think there are parents like that, but they've not gone far enough through the process, I think, for me to be involved. That um, I think a lot of those just drop out because it's too much work. Yeah, I think I can, sometimes by the time kids get to like a group care setting and they've gone through foster family after foster family, or maybe it's been like foster family attempt at reunification didn't go so well, or maybe mom couldn't quite follow her treatment plan, foster care, and then back with mom again. Um, and there have been, I think there's probably a higher likelihood of a kid ending up in a group care placement with a parent who really They've got so much ambivalence, they've got so much stacked against them that it's just helping them to sort through how much is theirs, how much is their kids, can you put the kids' needs first despite, you know, maybe a parent who has like a personality disorder, which could be 
um, very complicated. Um, and I do, I can think of a couple of parents off the top of my head that categorically were um, probably not going to meet the standards that Dr. Miller has on this sheet for good enough parenting. And they do eventually end up saying, I can't do this. And most mm -hmm. of the parents we work with that reach that point sort of come to that conclusion on their own. Like mm -hmm. I keep trying and I know, I know what is required of me and I, I just can't do it. And I know that my child needs something bigger than what I can give to them. And they do usually end up saying goodbye which is also really difficult for the kids but i think i'm sure as cindy's going to talk about more you do reach a point where the benefits um are not outweighed by the dangers of having a child placed in a not good enough parenting situation so mm -hmm. and a lot of these who aren't going to meet that mark of good enough parenting it doesn't mean that they're sociopaths it's a very different thing but that raises an interesting issue about um, sociopathy and antisocial personality disorder. And there was a study in England about um, kids, young kids, who are raised in a home with an antisocial dad have poor outcomes than if the dad is not present at all. Which I thought was uh, antisocial. Well, and that's it. You know, so, again, how do you define it? Because it was it was based on right, right, right. No, no, because that's not that's not antisocial. I mean, and not not asocial like they don't like to socialize, but antisocial antisocial personality disorder is is sociopathy, sociopaths. Can you define that? Okay, yes. Yeah, <laughs> About sociopaths. Um, they have a uh, lack of empathy, um, don't form close bonds with other people and kind of are incapable of doing that. Their orientation toward the world is one of how is everything going to benefit me. Um, but how it was defined in this study, it was really based on the mother's description of the dad. Um, and it might not be the best, but I mean, they were looking at some things about um, if, if the mom had been hit by the dad. Um, so if the dad had a criminal history, those kinds of things. Um, and so I thought that's good to know because I think often we think it's best if kids are in two parent families. And actually what this research was aimed at is because there was a movement about let's keep families together. We really, what can we do with social programs that keeps these people from getting divorced? What can we do to keep them together? And the research sort said, you know, there's some folks, we don't want to keep them together. Actually, the kids are going to be better off in these circumstances with antisocial dads if they're not present in the home. You know, it was pretty general kinds of things of just, I think, doing um, poor in school, doing poor developmentally. So it was pretty broadly based. Well, and, and they're much more likely to be diagnosed with a conduct disorder. And, you know, sort of kids diagnosed with conduct disorder are pretty high risk to an adult who'd be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. It's sort of that criminal mentality. Yeah, antisocial kind of gets thrown around, I think, in our modern society. It's just meaning like someone who just doesn't want to be around or get along with other Don't people. Don't like that, right, yeah. Yeah, antisocial personality disorder is really like the extreme <coughs> version of, I think, the good description of what's going to benefit me right now. Yeah, that, that lack of empathy, else. yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, serial killers generally are sociopaths, but that's the real extreme. You don't have to be a serial killer to, to have an antisocial personality disorder. So you're saying that the study showed um, not that like one biological parent is the is the ideal. Not it's not the it's the that's the preferred outcome, as opposed to a couple that is dysfunctional. Well, and not necessarily d dysfunctional, well, but, the, the di but the but the dad well, the is antisocial. Where the woman is antisocial. They didn't look at women antisocial because okay. there's uh, their lower lower base rate. 
but they didn't look at it. And, and that would be an interesting question of if the mom is... Say it again. Does it ever hey. happen to a woman? <laughs> 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 it does. Just, just much less um, frequently than the man. And I think you know that's why it wasn't studied is because it's hard to get the numbers. And that's just what I was going to say is that that's, that's an example of that, of um, using the kids' needs for their own. And that can happen with somebody who um, has antisocial personality disorder. But it can happen for other reasons, too, that parents are doing it and they're not aware that they're doing it that right. and I, I think like I think it's really important to like always then understand the context because it can like children in, that grow up in homes where domestic violence and abuse occurs take on very very specific roles oftentimes where you know they do things to please mom or help mom or help the person who is surviving violence and so um, you know they they follow really specific behaviors to within those roles so I think and mom doesn't necessarily obviously you know, w within the context of uh, dynamics of domestic violence, mom does not necessarily realize that or has right. the capability of like appropriately reacting to that. Right. So moving ahead with trying to pin down a little bit more specifically this idea of good enough parenting. One thing is certainly safety. That to be a good enough parent, you've got to be able to provide a reasonable level of safety for your child. Um, part of this is, um, I mean, certainly there's the physical safety and keeping your child physically safe. Part of it, which is a little bit more subtle, is being able to accurately detect dangerous situations and dangerous people. And this is what, you know, when kids grow up in uh, families with domestic violence, that uh, danger detection system can get way off kilter because their home is dangerous. And you know what we usually think of is home is safe and then you go out in the world and there's scary situations out in the world. If you grow up where the home is actually dangerous, but that's not what you're being told, your whole barometer of what's dangerous and what's not gets messed up. And you know it can get passed on generationally if if a mom was abused as a child, then sh she doesn't have a barometer, and she chooses a partner who's dangerous, but she doesn't pick up that they're dangerous. So then this next generation is being raised in a family with a dangerous parent, and that kind of thing can get perpetuated. So, and, and what we see sometimes with parents is they don't see that dangerous people are dangerous, so like uh, a mom will hook up with a pedophile, and have them in the home and babysitting the kids and um, may not know that he is a sexual offender but sometimes does know um, and says but he's safe you know he's nice to me he's kind you know whatever he would never do that to the kids when meanwhile I mean if you walked into the room your alarms would be going off of Ooh, this guy's giving me the creeps there's something off but the mom isn't picking up on that the reverse is the parents can think people are dangerous who aren't actually dangerous. And often what this is are, are the professionals. So uh, people in the department are dangerous, the evaluator is dangerous, the therapist is dangerous, everybody at Evolution Services is dangerous, the police are dangerous, and that's what they convey uh, to the kids. And you know, the people at the group home are, are dangerous. Um, and so that sets up a dynamic where it's very difficult to change because people who can help them change are viewed as dangerous and we need to stay away. And that's what gets um, signaled to the kids as well, which can put kids in a bind. I'm going to a therapist, but my parent thinks that this person's dangerous. So this is not making any sense. Why is my parent making me go to this therapist that they think is dangerous? What is going on in the world here? Um, and when you think about from a child's perspective, trying to sort out how do I figure out what's dangerous or n and not in that kind of scenario, it becomes very tricky. And they learn to not trust their reactions because, like, you know, they might feel like, wow, oh, you know, I like this therapist. He, she, he seems very nice. She seems very nice. But obviously my, my parent doesn't, so I don't know what to make of that. Who do I go with? Do I go with my parent or do I go with my gut instinct? 
And that's where, you know, early on, a lot how this can get off base is because kids learn to not trust their um, internal reactions because their parents have told them it's, it's wrong and have given them different feedback. Do you see this with the kids oh, at the group yeah. home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, all the time. That, yeah. that danger detection system is yeah. off yeah. kilter. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big issue with us. I mean, we talk about safety at the group homes. Of course, the cornerstone of what we do, but um, sometimes by the time we have kids that come to us, they have such big trust issues from this kind of setup where they're, they, they kind of sense that they're not supposed to trust these people who are their caregivers, but they're not really sure who they're supposed to trust, and they don't actually really know if they can trust themselves or the world, and um, it's very difficult to unravel. Well, I think when kids are in foster homes, too, parents can sometimes give these messages to the kids about, you know, what are they doing to you in that home? Are they being mean to you? And make it difficult for the kids then to be in the foster home because they're getting messages. And even if it's not verbal, a lot of it is transmitted non-verbally, that they're picking up, my parents think these people, these new people that I'm living with, are not okay and that they're a threat. And then the kids have to go and be in, in their home, which can be confusing. Questions or comments about that? Is that about something a kid might tell Casa? You know, usually I think kids can't articulate it that clearly. Um, I think what, what you can see it sometimes because what kids will do sometimes is they'll make their verbal comments match the parent's agenda, but their behavior says otherwise. So they might tell you, I hate my foster parents. They're really scary. They're mean. And then their foster parent walks into the room and they run to them and climb up in their arms. And so their behavior is saying something very different that their behavior is saying, I trust this person. But I'm, I'm telling you the party line because that's what, what I'm supposed to do. But when I do these evals and I do them early in the process, okay. I don't think, I, I don't ever say this person cannot be a good enough parent. I say here are what the problems are, that they're below the mark in these areas. And I might think pretty, um, it, it, and I'll outline the prognosis is not good Bec for these reasons, because we've got deficits in six areas, <laughs> um, because there are cognitive delays that are going to make it difficult for them to be able to bring that up. How often do you do it? Do you do an evaluation, or is an evaluation done in every case? No. 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 Okay. Just in some. Just in some. To answer, you, uh, answer the question, re remembering as it's being pointed, it's a process. And yeah. so it's not like you're going to you take a snapshot and then you make your... Right. So it, you're keeping in mind it's a process and people like Cindy are working with these parents and when they when they see this and coaching, parent coaching, visitations, okay. and they, they, they see the kids' reactions, they see the parents' nonverbal stuff and then they're coached. So, so it's not like they're, you're, that they're not being worked with. No, they, no, I... And I, then over time then... So Will Cindy do, if an evaluation's done, is an evaluation done again, like it's three months or six months so we can see progress? Or or how do we get notified? Is it is it through all, everybody? Does well, usually what happens is, like if I do an eval, it's hopefully pretty early in the process. And right. then I try to identify, so these things need to be worked on. And then there's regular treatment team meetings. And so those things can be tracked about what kind of progress are we making in each of these areas. Okay. So you can see, you know, okay, we're getting movement, we're getting movement on this one and this one, but this one isn't, isn't moving. Would you be going to those treatment team meetings? You know, the department has not asked me to, um, except periodically sometimes they'll say, you know, can you, we, the treatment team's stuck, can you come in and, okay. um, and I don't know that it's always been, organized that that way that um, I think everybody is figuring out how do we make best use of these evaluations because sometimes what happens is they get done and then they're put in the file um, and and nobody knows what's what's in there the therapists don't have copies and and then I don't think they're um, getting as much use as they could but this is a way I think that they can be used the best is 
by identifying those areas that they need to work on and then track. And it also provides very nice feedback for the parents. And I think of this as kind of like um, a, a model for a classroom that, you know, a student does work and they get a grade on it. So they see, you know, I got an A, great, I'm, I'm moving along. I got an F, I'm not making progress. Um, that that's a benefit to the parents and for it to be as, as realistic as, as possible and not sugar-coated where they can't figure out whether they're making progress mm -hmm. or not. Then sometimes, you know, I think what happens often in the process, the ideal is, is as the process unfolds, it becomes clearer. Of, okay, you know, this parent is really, they're working on stuff, things are going great, we're increasing visits, everything's going smoothly. And so everything starts transitioning, and, and the child's back in the home, and um, reunification is proceeding. Or, you know, we've been at this, I was involved in a case, we've been at this two years and have not been able yet to have unsupervised visits. The answer is, no, we are not making <laughs> enough progress here. Can this parent eventually get to that good enough mark? That's not the question. Which, you know, sometimes I think, as an expert, I had to inform the court that, that, that it's sort of a moot point because this child needs a parent now. They've been out of their parents' home for two years already and don't have a permanency plan they need a permanency plan now. They needed it. Isn't it 15 to 22 months? Right, so but some of them that get extensions and get oh, extensions and, get extensions. Um, yeah. So this that I'm talking about was an actual case, and actually I think it was, it was two and a half years mm -hmm. that had gone by that there, we had not been able to move beyond supervised visits. Can I ask, was it always kind of like, it was right, you know, on a scale from 1 to 10, it was always like at a 4 or 5, it was not never good enough to move forward to supervised visits, but it was always like enough to keep going? Right. And obviously she was making progress. It, you know, this is something that generally I talked about later. I go to every... I go to every scheduled thing and I actually really appreciate it when the cost workers are there because um, sometimes it takes a bit of an outside perspective. Sometimes you, you get so used to looking at behavioral patterns and emotional regulation and all this jibberty jabberty therapy talk <laughs> and you put it on the table and you've got like all of these sort of outside perspectives that can really look in and be, you know, just it's good to have this information in the back of your head in case you hear that this might be a pattern. I don't would never expect like a cost worker to come in and just be like, oh my gosh, I think this is happening and I should report on it. But what has evolved for me of a, a way to give feedback to parents? And when I do these evals, I do a feedback session with the parents and um, CASA workers are invited and their therapist and the social worker and attorneys. Um, so that everybody hears the, the same information. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been to one of yours, they're really good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so if we have good enough parenting here, I'll give feedback to parents about what their strengths are. So, you know, in, in, in this area, you're, you're up here and, um, in this area, you're up here. These are some strengths for you. Some areas that are challenges that right now are not up to this level are, and, and you know, list what they are and, and explain them. So then what I've been able to do is um, later, and like in this, this case with, that went on for two years, I was asked to look at things again and do a reassessment. And so what I could say is, okay, now she's here. She's made progress in, in these areas. But these things are still a problem. They're still below this mark the gap has not been closed. Because one of the things that happened is the judge saw there, there was change. She made progress. Uh, and really focused on testimony that indicated that. Um, 
but we hadn't lined it out this way in court, and that's one of the reasons that made me think about this to, you know, is there a clear way to delineate this to folks? Because we all hear what we want to hear, and so you can get mm -hmm. caught up in, but she's making progress, and, and it was substantial progress. She was regulating herself much, much better than she had been before. So it wasn't to dismiss that at all, but despite that, these were still significant problems. And then is, is that you base it on all of these abilities, basic needs, safety, ability right. to read emotional needs, right. physical needs, things like that? Right. Right. And, and I think this can be a way to try to organize some of the treatment team meetings mm -hmm. because it can, again, you know, that the parents therapist can say, she's, she's doing this and she's doing that and it's great and there's been this, this progress. And you know she's writing music and, and doing all of this really creative stuff and things like that's great, mm -hmm. except we haven't changed any of these things. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful that she's doing that and that helps her to feel better and relieve some stress for her. But these things are still the same. And so I think it can keep orienting people back to this. And so that way, it's not a surprise to the parent at the end of 18 months uh, that the department's moving for termination because they've been getting feedback all along of, but these things aren't changing or they're not changing enough. And I think the best outcome, if it's a parent who isn't gonna be able to meet this mark, is what Ivy was talking about when the parents come to that realization themselves, rather than having to go through a termination proceeding. It, it, but it it's, may speed the process along or maybe help for, for them to come to the realization if they're constantly reminded about what they need to to do to get there. And they need to, like I said, you need to buck up and, and, and they may have the resources to do it, you know, personal, or they just at some point are going to say, you know, I, I did, it's just not a tangible goal for me. Right. Right. I think that, that they help to, that, that they can start to see that. If I've been working really hard, but I'm not making progress. Or they do because it's like, okay, yes, this is going on in my life, and this is going on in my life, and this is going on in my life. I need to put all that aside, and I need to focus on these things. And so it can help get them organized so that they can move in a direction that's going to have the biggest impact on their kids because they could get sidetracked about doing something that, yes, is progress, but it's not moving them. Closer. Bringing it back to our roles of cost, is it our, is it our role to remind them of where they're at and where they need to be? Or is it, you know, I mean, not sit down and throw a flow chart out at them every time you see them, but just to constantly talk to them about, okay, remember, you know, I do the veterans treatment course. So like every week, you gotta come in and say what your goal is and what you're doing to get there and that kind of thing. I wonder if we're, we should do have those kind of conversations with the with you know teenage ki uh, you know uh, kids or, or the parents if we talk to them. Well, I think it can be helpful that the more that gets reiterated to them of kind of you know, where where are you you know when working on the regulating your emotions. How do you think you're doing with that? I think th the more that gets reinforced for them. What about talking to the kids about, like, when am I going to see my parents again? Or am I ever going to get back to my parents again and say, well, here's some of the things that, you know, uh, your, your folks need to do before you can get back there, and they're working on that, and mm -hmm. it's just going to be a time thing. Do you have those conversations at all? Or no. should you? <coughs> no, you, you, I mean, you have the conversation about they're working on things, to, but not to get into specifics. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want right. to say they're, they're needing not, they're working on their addiction, they're working on... Uh, this thing, but that, yeah, that they are engaged, if they are engaged, that they need work to do yet to, to make that happen. Well, how, how honest do we be with them if they're not engaged? You just say that they have, they have a lot of work to do yet. Okay. And I would not use the term with the kids. Your parents are working on being good enough parents. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you use that term with the parents? Do I? You know, I, I do, and, and, I've, yeah. and I've toyed with this. But no matter what you do, it's harsh because their kids were removed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they already feel like they're not good enough parents. Yeah. You don't really need to remind them or. And you know what I will say is those words. this does not mean you are not a good enough person. Right. It's a very different thing. It's not saying you're a bad person. It's just kids need certain things. And. Right. Um, so, and, and you know, when I've talked with parents, when I do these evaluations, I'll tell them at the beginning, I'm kind of known for being frank, and, and I, I want to put things out there as clearly to you as possible, 
so that you know what I'm talking about and it's not sugar-coated. Every single parent says, great, great, I appreciate that. Don't beat around the bush, just give it to me straight. So I think when it's, when it's laid out that way, and, and I say, you know, it's not meant to be critical or judgmental, it's just meant to provide a roadmap for you of where to put your energy and what you need to be working on. And I found parents are very appreciative of that. And then they're, um, I've been amazed at people's capacity to be able to sit and listen to this feedback. I mean, you think about it. Sit in a room with 10 people and the whole focus is on what you're doing wrong and how you're being a not good enough parent. It's hard to do that and not get defensive. And I've been amazed at um, how well parents have been able to do that when it's done in this way that really is, it's meant to be supportive of them. It's not meant to be judgmental. And when you have that kind of attitude, I think a lot of times parents can feel that and it makes them more open to working with it. And some of the uh, parents' attorneys have been very good too about saying, you know, hold on, hold on, you know, let's not argue. You're just here to listen. <laughs> right now and you know if you want to argue it we can do that in court and so a lot of their attorneys the attorneys have really gotten on board with this feedback session is not adversarial it's not meant for cross-examination um, it's just meant to convey and to, to get back to your question Braden I, I, the CASA's role really in this is to this is why this is such a good training too is to when you get to the treatment team meetings that they can go spiraling out of control like we talked about before. I mean, really, you, the CASA's role could be refocusing and saying, uh, wait, aren't we supposed to be talking about that kind of thing? Yeah. And aren't we supposed to be talking about what the kids need? Uh, and that type of thing. So your role would be in, in doing that, not making judgments or anything like that, but just refocusing the team. And in talking to parents, it would be open-ended questions about, like, how are you doing when you're, when you're looking at this and you're saying, how are things going as related to whatever. So that kind of thing. And often, I mean, like, the majority of cases, I don't do an evaluation. But I think the department usually has some, the, the treatment team, the treatment plan is kind of lined out this, this way of these are the things you need to be working on. So you can get this by other means other than an evaluation that I would do, but just by information that's available in the case and what the department is asking the parent to do. I have to say, when you get right down to it, most of the parents have a pretty good idea, for the most part, of the things that they're not quite at peak performance with. And I think, you know, as long as the thing that's super great about this is that when you're giving them, you know, these are your challenge areas, you're not just saying, and this is it, things are kind of hopeless. There is a road map. They know. They have a direction to go in. They have a specific thing to be working on. And I think just really encouraging them. Parents can always use pep talks, and hopefully you have good enough relationships with the families that you're working with that you can call them up and be honest, but be real and be empathic and supportive at the same time. Do you ever find parents go, wow, nobody ever told me this? Yes. That's encouraging. Right. It's like, okay, you know, now, now I can. I had no idea I was supposed to do this stuff. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. Wow. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll get to it. A lot of the parents are doing circle of security. Um, and I'm going to talk about that at the end. And I think it, it gives parents an excellent way to look at their parenting. And I've had a number of parents. I mean, it's like. You gave them the secret to the universe. It's like life now <laughs> makes sense <laughs> about their kids' behavior and what went wrong for them, and it's a very non-judgmental way. So we'll talk about that a little bit more near the end. So kind of moving through some of these other things with, with safety, they've got to be able to consistently respond to protect the child. Um, so that means, you know, if, if they've got a partner who is abusive that they have to consistently be able to step in and protect the child rather than taking the abusive partner's side. Um, they've got to be able, and this is more true with young kids, to be able to <coughs> multitask. Um, so I saw a parent who was um, autistic and had um, 
the way his attention worked was it was a block. So it's focused here, it's focused there. There was, he didn't really have the capacity to divide his attention. So if he was playing his video game, his attention, it was locked on the video game. The parent. The parent. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem with a two-year-old who is wandering around the house doing whatever. Um, and so this was a huge issue for him, and it was, there were a number of issues, but that was going to be one that would be difficult to, I don't think he wasn't going to change in that. It was the way his brain worked. It would be something that you'd have to figure out an alternative, like the wife is always there also. <laughs> Um, or he's not ever going to play his video games when the child is awake. That's something that only he, he can only do when the child is asleep and in the crib and the bars are <laughs> up. Um, with older kids, that ability to multitask isn't so critical. It's probably not going to be good enough. It's more, you know, it's, it's a useful thing to do, but it's not going to be something that that in and of itself means your child can't be in your home. Um, Ability to remain free of substances and uh, to have a safety plan if they're using substances. You know, a question that's come up sometimes is, if a parent is abusing a substance, does that mean automatically that they're not at that good enough parenting level? And I think it really depends <coughs> on their pattern of usage. Because I think parents can be binge drinkers. So they're functioning at that good enough parenting level most of the time they hit a rough spot and they go on a bender for several days and during that time they are not at the good enough parenting mark but if they know that and they know the signs that they're heading into it and they make arrangements for appropriate care for their child it's not optimal <laughs> but that's probably good enough um, if they're going on benders and they're not making arrangements, then you have to, you know, how often is that happening? And can they make some gains in terms of being able to see that coming? What about like uh, functional alcoholics, you know, I mean, get up and they go to work every day, you know, because that's how they pay for everything, you know, but just after work they go out and have a few beers or something like that. Is that, and is that considered substance abuse or is that? I would look at um, how are they functioning? So. You know, are they coming home and are they spending time with their kid and, and are they attuned to them and picking up on, on what they need and responding to their needs? And if so, then, you know, I guess then, again, it's not optimal, not what you would suggest or recommend, but that's probably good enough. If they're coming home and, and they just camp out in front of the TV and they're not attending to their kids at all, then they're probably not reaching that good enough mark. But not necessarily because of the alcohol, because they're not attending to their kids. Right, right. So I would well, want to look at that. Back to the question, well, if there's substance abuse, is it automatic? And it seems to me like that would be substance abuse, but it's not necessarily the reason why they're... they're right. So I think you're looking more at what are the effects. I mean, some parents use substances, and so they're having a lot of unsafe people come in the house mm -hmm. who are buying and selling drugs and partying and being out of control. And that's the stuff that's really dangerous rather than necessarily Beer, the... Legal, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can think of one case in particular where the mom was had a medical marijuana card and my gosh, my golly, she tried quitting that drug and her anxiety was so off the charts when she wasn't using marijuana that she slipped underneath that good enough parenting mm -hmm. line. And it's easy sort of as an outside looking in to say, well, you can't smoke marijuana and raise your kids. This isn't good enough parenting. But for her, um, having a, like a safety plan and using this in a, the most responsible way possible, again, wasn't optimal, but it helped her to be a good enough parent. So I, there's just so many ca ca caveats. You know, I saw a parent. It wasn't with a, uh, an eval. It wasn't through the department. It uh, was a different type of eval. And he used medical marijuana, and when I did the first interview with him, he was not on it. And he, he also had ADHD, and he was all over the place. And he just made me crazy, because I couldn't ask a question and get a straight answer. I mean, you know, it was here and there and all over the place. When I was going to do the observation of he and his child, I said, please use your marijuana. 
um, because he, he all he that's what he did typically and so I wanted to see him of how he would typically be with his child and he typically would have used his medical marijuana he was a different person he was so much calmer I think he was a much better parent on using the marijuana than he was off it. I mean, it, so, yeah. I think too, like when that becomes an issue, like when substances become an issue, like looking at it from the addictions perspective is like, are they going through withdrawals and what are they doing when they go through withdrawals? And are they putting all their time and effort into finding the substance, therefore like neglecting their child and or all their money. spending all the, yeah, time, yeah. money, energy, you know, and, and I think that it, it happens like on a continuum, like I can, you know, be like the mom who's smoking pod, you know, and who can do that in a safe, contained way versus like addicts who have, you know, needles sitting out and spoons that are used, and things like that right. where, so I think, yeah. Right. You have to look at the whole context. Um, ability to manage their emotions. This is a this is a big one, and it, and it plays a part in safety. It comes up in other things too about being able to be attuned to your child. If you're emotionally dysregulated, um, you're not going to be able to be attuned to where your child's at because too much is going on for yourself. It can become a safety issue because if you're not able to regulate your anger, you can lose control of the anger, and kids can get hurt. Um, but not, not just with anger, parents can get flooded with their own sadness and grief and just be unavailable. That they're so wrapped up in that that they're not paying attention to what's going on with their kids. And again, that can be a safety issue. Uh, it can be a neglect issue. It can be an issue about them not being able to be attuned and responsive to their child. And, and that happens for a lot of these parents because so many of them, I would say the vast majority, have histories of abuse themselves. So a lot of them have a lot of PTSD going on and they can get flooded with all kinds of um, emotions that get in the way of good enough parenting. Um, and ability to attend to the child's need despite a parent's medical condition. And you know, sometimes what, Parents will say, but you know, it's not my fault that I have this medical condition. It's like, but it doesn't have anything to do with whether it's anybody's fault or not. It's a reality. And so we have to look at that and look at how does the medical condition affect the good enough parenting um, and figuring out ways around that. Um, some parents are on pain medication, and that might mean in the morning they're not functional. They cannot get up reliably and get their kids off to school. So you might have to have a plan where there's somebody that comes into the house to do that. Later in the day, maybe, you know, by the time school's out, they're up and have been up for a few hours and they're okay. But maybe periodically they have a flare up and they're not okay and then there needs to be a plan for the kids. Sir? I'm wondering about, do you ever call uh, a doc in if, say, somebody's uh, an epileptic. And there are some drugs that don't cause nearly the drowsiness and you know would, would hopefully be effective as well. Do you ever contact uh, or does someone ever contact their doctor and say this is really a problem with this mom? Um, are there some better alternatives? Right, I think you know absolutely using doctors as, as a resource, and I would say their doctor and um, helping, I would suggest helping the parent to be able to do that. That if they can do things for themselves, we want them to do it for themselves rather than us doing it for them. Um, so figuring out how that can happen if there's somebody that can, and I don't know whether that's appropriate for a CASA worker to accompany a parent to a doctor's appointment, if the parent wants that. Yeah, and well, it's certainly a parent, a, a part of the CASA's role to check in with the doctor, so to, to do that. But again, treatment team meetings, I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that you deal with, and then you pose that and say, if she's so, if she's so groggy in the morning and pose it to the team, what can, we, what can be done to mitigate that? You know, and one thing would be checking with the doctor, because they do uh, uh, evals along the way. They'll, they'll uh, monitor what's going on and, and then check with the doctor and change medications. And so that would be definitely a role in that 
Yeah, I wouldn't arena. think that a casa would, you no. know, pick yeah. up the phone and call the doctor. Yeah, but yeah. that it, that certainly is a way to. It's something you can research. Just look at a physician desk reference online and see you know, if there's different kinds of drugs for that. That I mean, you know what you're talking about. Like you, yeah. Yeah. Is there, do you have any no. issues? Though, like, say, like their insurance will only fund a certain type of prescription mm -hmm. for that type of disease that they have, or sometimes. But, you know, I don't know that that's so much the issue, and especially if you can make an argument for why it needs to be something different. Okay. And I think it's also good to get a doctor's feedback on what is the impact with this medication. What is this parent not able to do? Are they can they operate a vehicle? when they're taking this medication? Um, are there any things that we need to be aware of, of ways that it could impact their parenting, that it affects their attention or things like that? And I think doctors can give very succinct feedback about that. Uh, it, it would, I would expect that it would affect this, but not that. I will say too, a lot of times when there's a new treatment plan or a family that's you know just working at the very beginning and to try and get everything pieced back together, a lot of parents are on uh, medications for mental health issues maybe for the first time in their life and it might take them some time to find the right thing and really mm -hmm. get adjusted and um, you know, I think being able to give them feedback like, oh, you, you don't quite seem like yourself today, you seem a little bit groggy you know, what might be going on for you and how, how are these medications working out? Because sometimes it takes you know, a few different trials of meds before someone feels like they're really situated on something appropriate. Mm -hmm. So is it pretty common to encounter undiagnosed mental illnesses? I mean, that's, there's a lot of it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Only luck. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to say that? <laughs> uh, well, let me move through the rest of these things fairly quickly, and then we'll take a break. You do a 10-minute break? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another good enough criteria is ability to meet basic needs, and so part of this is recognizing, responding to changing developmental needs. This can sometimes be an issue with DD parents, um, and especially with infants that they might be able to learn things, but it takes so long to learn it that by the time they've learned it, the child is at a different developmental stage and has different needs, and so that could be a problem. Um, just keeping the child and home clean, budgeting family resources, um, getting kids to necessary activities like school. You know, one of the things I think that's been done sometimes when parents have difficulty with that, like when the kids have been in their care, the kids are um, not getting to school on time, they're missing a lot of school, that um, to see if parents are ready to do that, that they have to be up and present themselves someplace every day by 8 o'clock in the morning. And that they have to be able to, de that they can demonstrate they can do that for this length of time before reunification, before kids start being back in their home. Because if they can't do that, get themselves up in some place, then they're not going to be getting their kids up someplace. So that's a step that you can put in there to help make sure they're able to do that. Um, another requirement is ability to read the child's physical and emotional needs, to just be able to tell what's going on with the child. Um, physical needs are important with infants. Um, I think, you know, it's not so critical as, as kids get older, but just being able to read um, what's going on with the kids and respond. Um, to respond consistently enough to the child's needs, the ability to place their child's needs above their own, and this is one that, that keeps coming up. And, and parents have a hard time with this because I think they think of it pretty concretely like, if I have a sandwich and I just have one sandwich, I'm going to give it to my kid. I'm not going to eat it. That's ridiculous. I wouldn't eat it and have my child starve. I would give it to my kid. So obviously I can put my kid's needs before my own. I think where it's a problem more is when they can't see um, their own needs and the kids. So this, like, I'm going to turn my kids against the foster parents because it meets my agenda and I don't understand how that impacts my child, that my child has to go home with these people who I've just um, informed them are, are terrible, horrible monsters. 
So that's where it comes more into play about being able to differentiate that. It's kind of related also to um, allowing a child to establish a separate identity. Some parents have difficulty with that. I don't know how many times I've heard parents describe their kids as, a, she's a mini-me, he's a mini-me. Um, and they can't see ways that their child's different. You know, I know what my, my kid likes because if I like it, they like it. And if I don't like it, they don't like it. And they're not able to see that their child has um, different likes, dislikes, desires. Um, and an ability to set limits and take charge with the child. And some parents really struggle with this, that the kids are running the show. And, um, and again, you know, this is hard about where is that good enough parent, because you know, lots of parents struggle with setting limits. We, we all have, it, you know, we tend to, it's easier for us to do the nurturing part or it's easier for us to do the limit setting part. We tend to have a strength, so we struggle a bit um, one way or the other. And it's hard to know where is that mark of that it's not good enough. Sometimes in um, families that are involved with the department, it's not, it, it's, it's very <laughs> apparent. It's not such a subtle distinction that um, there are some parents who just can't, almost in any circumstances, set limits. You know, other than I'm going to, you know, a three-year-old saying I'm going to go drive the car, that then maybe they'd say, maybe not. <laughs> Um, but it, it can be so hard, and you know, for some of these parents, what gets in the way is it feels mean to them. And you know, if I say no, my child's going to cry, and I can't stand to see her cry. And for some of them, what that is is because if I see my child cry, it taps into my own pain and grief, and then I'm flooded with my own emotion. So I can't let my child get upset because it triggers it triggers me. I'm going to move on to the second page, um, and this is where I usually do this about the, the feedback and structuring it. <coughs> One of the things that I note too is, this is sort of for your average child. If you've got multiple kids, then you need a higher level of parenting skill. If you've got kids yeah. with special needs, it's higher. And one of the, one of the um, comes up quite frequently is reactive attachment disorder, and it requires a higher level of skills. And I'm going to let Ivy take over well, here. We had a speaker <laughs> that actually said that that was on the downswing, and you know everything used to be ADHD and ADD, and now it's all rad. And and rears your ugly head. Again. That sh you know, and everybody's diagnosed with rad, kind of implying that. Over it's it's overused over and overdiagnosed and maybe should not be given. So could you yeah. address that? <laughs> yeah, it probably is. Um, I think, you know, instead of just looking at the label, it's really it's a way of describing a collection of behaviors. And so label, no label, rad diagnosis, no rad diagnosis. You might be working with a family with a kid who has a lot of prominent behaviors that look like rad behaviors but they don't have a diagnosis or they have a diagnosis of rad but they're really like on the minimal side of having attachment issues um so let me do my best to categorically define what this is and um, sometimes i get really excited talking about this so <laughs> if i go too fast or if it's sounding too complicated someone just got to flag me down um so reactive attachment disorder um usually comes about because of um, some kind of major disruption in early, uh, the early developmental years, um, especially before age two. That's kind of the big one. Um, it can definitely happen after age two, really up until age five. Um, but really we're looking at um, major, major disruption, a disruption that's so big in this child's life that their worldview has been altered. And um, so, for instance, um, instead of perceiving that the world is safe, their fundamental worldview is that the world is not safe, and they start operating out of that belief. Or a worldview of, I'm not safe, and then they start operating out of that world worldview. And so how these behaviors tend to manifest themselves 
is that the child has a fundamental lack of trust either in themselves or their caregivers or the world or safety. And then they start sort of operating on survival mode. And so a lot of the behaviors might manifest in these like fight or flight behavior. So they're having really big reactions to things that you would not normally um, conceive of a child to have, especially in their caretaking relationships. Um, I hesitate to say that reactive attachment disorder is always the product of not good enough parenting because sometimes a child really truly can have a disposition that's just um, a fundamentally um, bad fit for the parent and the parents maybe aren't reading the kids cues and the kids aren't really reading the parents cues and then they have this disruption in that sort of way. Um, but really most of the time what we're talking about is um, neglect and abuse. Um, it used to be that we used the word attachment sort of as this catch-all term for kids that have a hard time trusting caregiving figures. We don't so much use that term anymore. I think the term we probably would hear now is, you know, relational developmental trauma, which means that at some point in their developmental early relational bonds, there was some kind of disruption. Um, so kids sort of um, go two separate ways. Um, they either have sort of this presentation, um, which we would call like sort of an indiscriminate presentation. So these are the kids that um, run up to you that don't know you and hug you and they want to throw your ar their arms around you and sit in your lap. Um, so they're o overly trusting of the world. Um, or they have um, more of like an inhibited, they don't trust anybody, the world is a scary place, no one could ever take care of them, and so they are like really guarded and reserved. Um, so I think when you're thinking about um, attachment disorders in general, what we're really looking at is the child's um, inability because of their worldview to trust um, their caregivers to meet their basic needs. And so kids start figuring out all these other ways to get these basic needs met that is not sort of a straight shot basic need. So you have a kid who's like pretty, you know, on a pretty good developmental track they're able to say to their parents, like, Mom, I'm hungry, can I have some food? Or I had a really tough day at school, my friend was picking on me. Kids who have these reactive attachment disorders because they either don't trust themselves or the world or their caretakers, they might um, have a tough day at school and then go home and pick a fight with their brother. And so it's really hard to sort of fetter out what's going on. So they have this need that they need to get met. You know, maybe they need some attention or some care from their caregiver. But instead of going to the caregiver and saying, I had a really crappy day, I need help, they start this fight with their sibling, and then the parent has to step in, and that's how they get the attention. So it's just all these sort of roundabout ways of trying to get their needs met. When kids come into our group home or into a foster family from our agency, the two main things that we're really looking at with these kids to help them stabilize is can they accept basic care and can they accept basic limits from adults? Um, because nine out of 10 times, um, kids who have reactive attachment disorder type behaviors struggle in both of those dimensions. Um, they might act like they want to be close to adults, but then when it actually comes down to real intimacy, it's they're so terrified of not getting those basic needs met that they just freak out and push people away and however, you know, whatever numerous behaviors they're gonna do that with. Um, or they're so used to fending for themselves and they have such a need for control in their own lives that uh, allowing other adults to step in and make those decisions for them or set those limits or set those boundaries is also too scary because it means that someone might actually be taking care of them predictably. Um, and so then they have all these big behaviors. Um, so it's kind of an elusive thing to track from the outside looking in, um, and it's not like a diagnosis I would hand out without really getting to know a kid very well, because I think it is sort of a, it implies a serious long-term trajectory of needing a lot of care and a lot of services, and sometimes kids just have a lot of grief and, is grief and loss issues, and they're presenting with anger because they're sad, or they're um, withdrawn because they're really anxious, and they're just having a hard time. So I don't want to suggest um, seem like every kid that you run into that has any of these behaviors m may have a rad diagnosis, but it's certainly possible. Um, as far as like parental situations go with these kids, um, things we teach our parents that are important for our kids who have reactive attachment disorder 
Um, one is basic attunement. Um, so we're really looking at can the parent be in the same place with this child and accurately read their cues? Can they use those cues to inform themselves about what their child needs? And then can they respond to that need in an appropriate way? Um, so attunement's a huge piece. Um, can the parents set good limits? Because a lot of times, um, like Cindy was saying, we have parents that come in with so much, you know, generational trauma that, you know, it was their parents before them and their parents before <coughs> them um, that didn't really have this big grasp of how to, you know, parent kids or maybe there was mental health or substance abuse and, um, and they just don't know really what they're doing with the limits. Um, I forgot I was going to go with this. I, I have a family, for instance, that we worked with um, who she just, she loved her little kid so much and she was really great with the nurturance and the attunement piece, um, but she was so frightened of setting limits with this child because um, every time her child cried, it reminded her of when she was a child and had um, these horrible traumatic experiences. And so she just didn't set limits for this kid. And then the kid never felt safe because there was never any containment or um, boundaries in her environment. And then so she started having all these big um, like acting out behaviors where she would run around the room and tip furniture over and throw things. Um, and she calmed down pretty quickly when her mom was able to really step in and offer even basic boundaries and limits. Um, so it's not like a you're screwed up for life if you have this diagnosis. Kids really do respond to their environments, especially when they're super little. And um, so that offering care, which would be like the attunement piece, and then offering limits, which would be like the limit setting for the boundary piece. Those are sort of the two pistons that I always think about when we're looking at um, parenting and um, especially with the kids that come into our group home. A lot of the kids that we have come in um, without parents um, and so we're in the process of trying to find them foster families to live with and um, so our, our two big our two biggies for safety with them is um, care and control is what we would call it um, so all of this making sense <laughs> for those of us that are parents, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, for the, and, and not belittling the people for those that aren't mm -hmm. parents. Yeah. So it's really an issue of basic trust, I guess, if I could boil it down to something. These kids have a fundamental inability to trust their caregivers. And sometimes it's because their caregivers have been doing things that have not been building trust in their relationships. Um, and sometimes it's because they were removed when they were six months old and they were placed with someone else temporarily or um, we worked with a kid who was hospitalized for um, like two months when she was six months old and that disruption of even being in the hospital had caused her to have some serious um, issues with her the bond with her mom and it was nothing that the mom had do done the child needed to be in the hospital so I also want to make sure that we're not um, outright demonizing parents because sometimes um, it's just bad circumstances. It really, truly is bad circumstances. Sometimes it's the parents. Um, sometimes I think a big one for us, we see a lot of parents who um, maybe have chemical dependency problems. They have a really hard time regulating themselves, either their emotions or their energy level. And so they're either really overwhelming to the kids or they're really underwhelming to the kids and um, just have a really hard time with that attunement piece, not really being able to accurately see things as how they are and responding to their own stuff instead of their kids' stuff. That's really common. Um, And I'd like to emphasize what Ivy was saying about there's a problem in the kid's worldview. Um, because that's at it, it's such a deep level that it, it's not just behavioral. Because um, you can look at the behavior and it looks like, well, these kids are out of control. And so if you just give structure and limits, then you've solved the problem. But it's not just on the surface. It's this whole way of organizing the world of, you know, I can't trust the world out there, so I have to be in control. That's the only way I can feel safe. And that's what you've got to address. So it's at a much deeper level than just a child who's having behavioral problems. We worked with a mother, um, for instance, um, this was a few years ago, and her daughter had reactive attachment disorder. And really, um, 
her daughter's worldview was basically, I can't trust anyone to get my needs met, and I'm also not even allowed to ask. And um, that really, this is a child who um, was remo removed from her birth mother at birth, placed in two or three foster placements um, before her, um, it was a kinship placement, ended up taking her, it was a maternal aunt. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there was really sort of things set in motion already from the beginning that um, was later then exacerbated by um, this family because what had happened was they had so much um, care and concern for this kid that they were um, to the point where they were overwhelming her and creating more anxiety within her um, because she was our, she already had this message um, like I can't trust anybody to get my needs met and then suddenly she has these parents who are coming in and kind of doing an overkill and their anxiety around making sure her needs were met was making her anxiety go up and then she was acting out and doing these behaviors. How old was she? Uh, 10. Which was making the family anxious, which, which was making them want to overcompensate. And so mm -hmm. it's really looking at that underneath um, this child has issues from the day she had to say goodbye to her birth mother and we need to calm the whole system down. And so really getting the parents to look at um, this child, what, what does this child really need from you? What emotions do you really need to make sure you are catching and what emotional needs do you really need to meet for her? Because they thought they were meeting her emotional needs by you know, being overly reassuring and really wrapping around and they really needed to see this child's worldview is that no one is capable of taking care of them and we're reinforcing this by running around like people you know, with their heads cut off. And so it was really a matter of just calming the whole family system down, but really emphasizing that this is where this kid's coming from. And it's um, not that she's rejecting what you're giving her or um, you're not in, you know, on purpose trying to make it worse. And she's not trying to make it worse in response to your care. It goes back to these really basic needs. And really, all I can say about reactive attachment disorder is um, the only thing that I know of that makes it better is repeated, consistent, predictable, corrective experiences. You can tell a kid up one side and down the other that you're safe and this is a safe place and these people are safe and these are the things we're going to do to meet your basic needs, but until they experience it day in, day out, day in, day out in exactly the same way, it takes a long time to rewire those neural networks and those little brains, especially if they're already missing other developmental pieces. So. Um, Really in the group homes where I'm at, we don't even expect to see a change in those behaviors for an entire year. I mean, it is a really long process, especially for these kids who had such horrific early childhood experiences. It just takes that long for the brain to grow new neural networks so that they can have an alternative worldview. So what's your approach, like theory, like is it atta mm -hmm. attachment theory? Yeah. So, I mean, we're really, um, like, at our level, and, and many, I mean, some of you may end up working with me and may have kids placed in group care, so I guess it's important to know that um, these, it's, it's, it's a daily battle giving these kids their basic needs because they are so convinced that you are not going to do it and you're not going to do it tomorrow and you're not going to do it tonight and maybe you're not going to feed me and maybe you say that it's safe when I'm going to bed but I don't think that it is. It takes so, it just takes so long and people have a tendency I think who are um, sort of new to these kids to not see any real big progress and I just would caution everybody to hold on well, then past that year mark, at least, because that's really how long it takes. Sometimes it takes longer, but I, I, once they have even this small little slice of, gosh, you know, she has been doing what she's been saying for the last year, and it has been safe when I've gone to bed at night, and yeah, actually, I have had meals that have been healthy meals for me. Okay, maybe I can just extend trust a little bit, and we're not even talking like, okay, I'm, I'm cured, I'm fine, I'm fixed. I am going to be functional in school and in all my social relationships and I'm going to allow myself to be parented by safe caregivers. Um, it maybe just says, okay, well maybe next time I'll think about going to you when I have a problem at school and I'll just see how it goes. 
So it's really like painstakingly um, slow building of that trust. But, um, you know, I think for any of us who have good trusting relationships in our adult lives, those develop over time. It takes time. It takes time to trust people. And these kids um, usually have come from so far down that they're really just clawing their little hands up the side of the hill hoping to get to a plateau. So it takes time. And I think um, part of the issue with react kids with reactive attachment disorder, um, they do all of these um, push-pull behaviors away from the people who want to help them because they don't really understand why people are consistently trying to help them. It's foreign to them. They're so used to surviving on their own that they don't really understand why. They don't trust it. They don't suddenly trust that people are going to take care of them. And so they do a lot of limit testing. So for some parents and foster parents, that can really look um, like pretty chaotic behavior because these kids are trying to figure out, well, if I throw a tantrum, are you going to put me in timeout? Or are you going to hit me? And if I decide not to take my bath, are you going to withhold dinner from me? Or is everything still going to be okay? And so a lot of these kids have to go through these corrective experiences where they're refusing to take a bath and finding out that, okay, everything's going to be okay. This wasn't that big of a deal. Okay, maybe I don't need to worry about this part anymore. And so then their the energy will shift to bigger things. And um, But over time, they do redevelop a predictable, rhythmic understanding of what it means to be car cared for by safe parents. Um, and usually that's um, when the real you know therapeutic work comes in, at least, because then you can really say to them, okay, things were really bad before. You have an idea or at least a hope of an idea that things can be better now. So let's really talk about what's going on for you. Where did these messages come from that you can't trust people? Where did these messages come from that no one's going to care for you or that your feelings aren't safe? And so, I mean, it just, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, um, but it does happen. And I do think, um, especially when there is a birth parent involved, you can step back in and be that consistent, predictable, loving, safe caregiver, man, that is the best. It's just the best because they want to trust their parents so bad. They want to be with their parents so bad. They'd so much rather be with their um, father who maybe drinks too much on the weekends but is trying to get a handle on it than someone they don't know. I mean, it's just... Um, the relational bonds are so strong, even if it looks like from the outside that things are really bad. Um, I think always trying to work with the parent first is absolutely the way to go. And sometimes it doesn't work out, um, like I think we talked about earlier. But yeah, I guess I would just emphasize that it takes time and it takes lots of repetition. Um, I will also say uh, some common problems that I have run into working with CASAs. Um, sometimes when we have these indiscriminate kids that want to run up and hug everyone, um, you start maybe getting the idea that like, oh, I'm this person's like be all end all and I'm just going to sweep in and we're going to go to the carousel and I'm going to buy them ice cream and this kid loves me. And then you drop them back off, um, you know, at the foster family or the group home or um, wherever it is and then they have these horrible behaviors and you just can't even like believe your mind because they were so great with you and that sometimes can be a product of that reactive attachment disorder they're okay going out with you because you're a stranger and they don't have to trust you to take care of them so their level of need for safety is just it's not the same and especially if they come from situations where their barometer for what is safe and isn't safe is all skewed up and they're used to going out with strangers this is an okay thing for them. It shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and I think sometimes the other thing um, that I've seen um, CASAs get a little sidetracked with at times, and completely understandably, um, sometimes it's really hard to form real, genuine, intimate relationships with these kids. And so a lot of peripheral things start happening, like um, suddenly a CASA worker will show up with a box of brand new clothes, which is super great um but like this kid really needs to spend time with you they really need you they just need you to show up with your genuine lovely selves whoever you might be um and they need that relationship they don't they don't they might say bring me this bring me that this is what i need but that's the, the same sort of avoidance of i don't really trust you to take care of me so could you just bring me some ice cream next time you come and that's fine with me mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I would just, I would challenge, um, as uncomfortable or strange as it might be to have relationships with kids that are acting this way, to really 
go for it and be there for them and have fun with them and talk to them because that's what they really need. They need an experience of safe people who are interested in them, who care about them, who care about their well-being. So there was for a long time lots of research that said when kids um, have come out of these traumatic situations that they first need to experience um, safety and um, there was not a lot of studies and so I'm not actually sure where this came out of that said um, they should probably take a break from their parents have like a cool down period and that's just not any we just don't do that anymore um, it's been years and years and years since we've done that so I'm relieved to tell you if you have a child who's coming to group care their parents can absolutely see their kid day one day two day three day four day five <coughs> Um, I am interested in seeing the parent as soon as possible just to get a baseline evaluation of where they're at. I think it's really helpful before um, sort of the case starts to unravel and unwind and go wherever it's going to go. Um, we do get accused of being called fake parents. We have um, what are called attachment counselors that work in the home with these kids and their main job is to meet their basic needs and so they're doing a lot of attunement work with them. And, <coughs> Um, they're really developing these pretty significant relationships with these kids so that these kids have this corrective experience, um, which is what they need. It's a huge part of their treatment. Um, but I think parents absolutely feel threatened by that. I can't even imagine having a kid out of my placement and someone else is parenting them based on like a totally different, separate set of rules or you know philosophy of parenting i think that's absolutely it would absolutely be terrifying and i do think attorneys rightfully so um need to know about that and they need to hear what's actually going and i um would invite anybody who is interested in coming to the group home to come to the group home including the attorneys because it just it's not that way um but absolutely looking in from the outside we've Fake parents, I think that's that's the worst. I hate that that term because um, we're not there to be these kids' parents. We're there to offer them a corrective experience. But yeah, we're getting into the bathtub at night and washing their hair and helping them, you know, with bedtime books before stories. And sometimes we rock them in rocking chairs and um, we're doing things that five, six, seven year olds need to have. And we wish the parents were there to do it for them. And when the parents are ready to come in and do it for them. They come in and do it for them. So we have parents in and out of our houses all the time, um, and thankfully for it because the kids really, they, I love it. I wish every kid had a parent who could come after school and do homework with them and play catch with them outside and help them get ready for dinner and help them take a bath at night and tuck them in. I mean, that would really, that would be optimal. A lot of the parents we work with I have so many things going against them and so many scheduling things going against them. They just can't make it happen. But Gosh darn it, they would if they could. Um, and I think the kids know that, you know, they, that gets conveyed to them. So, um, yeah, that's an old way of looking. I think that's an old way. I'm glad we don't do it that way anymore because it would be horrifying to have your kid play somewhere and not be able to see them for, I mean, we used to go a month, yeah. which is a really long time. But, yeah, research doesn't really support that. I'm wondering, you know, I keep hearing people talking about the, you know, the relationship that you're going to build with the kid and that that's obviously promoted so that they have some faith in you. At the same time, at some point, the case is going to be over and I'm going to leave. And if they like me and want me to be involved in their life, that isn't, you know, I, I've heard multiple people say that they still visit their kids on occasion after their case is over. But I, on some level, I feel like I'm another person who's going to be, oh, I care about you, that I'm here for you, and then I'm going to be gone to some degree. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I probably in a few years will be gone. So where, mm -hmm. is it helpful mm -hmm. for the kid to, to be, I mean, maybe just tell them that up front, like, eventually I'm not going to be here so they're not having, so that I'm not letting them down in that fashion so that they realize that I'm here now, but I'm, but I may not always be and I'm not, that's not my purpose in your life. I'd say kids pretty much live in the here and now most of the time, and even if you had that conversation with them, I don't think you would really register. Um, and also, they really do need someone in the here and now, and when you cross that bridge, you cross that bridge. So, I mean, I guess, also I have to say, a lot of these kids are really used to people coming in and out of their lives. Well, that's, that's sort of the norm. I mean. I mean yeah, I mean, I, without getting too therapy-ish on you, <laughs> 
Um, I would say that that's not really the kid. The kid doesn't really need that from you. Right. You might want that for yourself so that you don't feel like you're going to hurt the kid at the end. If the relationship ends, the kid's going to get hurt, and there's really no way to avoid that. I mean, I think there's some things you can do to minimize it, um, but really the kid just needs you here and now. So You don't want to promise them things that you can't deliver, so you don't want to say, I will be here for you always. Ever and, and ever. Yeah. yeah. Well, the idea is for us to provide, help them get to a place that is permanent, safe, and, and, and then we become unnecessary. It's kind of like Mary Poppins. I don't know if you guys remember <laughs> that, that movie, but you know, at the end, then the, the kids, they, they form this very close attachment with her, but at the end, they don't need her anymore because right. their parents have stepped up to the plate and it's time for her to, to go mm -hmm. and life to move on. I have to laugh too. Um, this is not all that relevant, but my mom was a CASA worker and um, had a very hard time leaving her case. And then they couldn't find a family for this kid. And so now I have a new um, stepsister who lives with my mom because she just <laughs> fell in love with this kid and there wasn't anybody else. She was also an older kid. She's 14, so they're a little more challenging to place. But, I mean, I just I don't think you can ever know what's going to happen in the future. And so you just do today. <laughs> what about future traumas like break up with your boyfriend? Yeah. So. Your best friend doesn't like it anymore. Normal things that happen in life that are like traumatic, but maybe more traumatic yes. to these kids. Yes. How do you prepare for them? And do you still in the home do that? If they're going through a hard time, you just pull them in closer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. It really depends on the kid, it really depends on the situation, it really depends on what they need emotionally in the moment, and really making sure we're make, meeting those basic needs, so. Yeah, things are harder for our kids, mm -hmm. for sure, and they need a lot of extra support. And I will say, um, I think a lot of people that get into this line of work early mm -hmm. on, and people who are coming in who may not have a lot of experience, there's a real drive and desire to want to, you know, fix and solve and, and mend and exacerbate and, or not exacerbate, ameliorate, <laughs> don't exacerbate. <laughs> um, and I can tell you these kids benefit the most from just having someone who's a calm presence who is just willing to be with them. It's there's no, no words you have to have, there's nothing you have to do, there's no actions you have to take unless they're in serious danger. Um, otherwise, they really just, they need someone to hold their hand or put their arm around them and tell them I'm here this is okay we're okay so yeah I mean it's they need a lot and they deserve a lot and they'll usually get a lot in the system one way or the other so you know part of the circle of security it's talking with parents about being with kids um, and I think it's it's good advice for CASA workers too, and it's talking about that being present in the moment and not being a fix-it person. Um, have any of you seen the movie Little Miss Sunshine? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, yeah, there's a wonderful scene that really depicts being with when the teenage boy has this lifelong dream to be a pilot and he discovers he is colorblind, so his dream is <coughs> gone. And he has a major meltdown. They stop the van. He's screaming, tells the whole family, and is way out of control. I mean, the actor is tremendous. And the, the mom doesn't quite know what to do. She goes down, and it's sort of like, you know, honey, I don't know. And he just won't have any part of it. His little sister comes down, and she just squats down next to him. <laughs> And she just bees with him. <laughs> and after a minute, he gets up and goes with her and apologizes to the family. And I think that's, that's the power of being with and that that little girl knew it. The mom was trying to fix it and make it better. Of how am I going to fix his dream that he lost when the reality is you're not. You're not. It's just a deeply painful experience. <laughs> and that little girl just was with him through it. And I think that's what you can do as CASA workers for the kids where 
I mean, you're doing things to help fix their situation in the background, but when you're with them, that you just are with them. Is it okay if we move on? Okay. Um, consequences of not meeting this minimum standard and why it's so important. There was this huge study done about adverse childhood experiences, the ACE study. And they just, they, they looked at 10 different categories and you get a check mark for each one, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, parental divorce, um, ten, 10 different things. And, and it's just, you know, you get one mark if, if that category has happened to you. The more of them you have, the more likely things will go wrong in your life across the board. It was just this huge study. So poor academic performance, poor job performance, more likelihood to have mental uh, disorders. If you're a girl, more likely to get pregnant as a teenager. If you're, more, if you're a boy, more likely to get a girl pregnant as a teenager. It's just across the board, pervasive, worse outcome, the more of these adverse experiences you have. And really, you know, what the, the reason for that is because as you have these multiple insults, it affects brain development. And that's why you're getting such a pervasive effect, because you're affecting things at the root. And I like to talk about here about the, the limbic system. So essentially what, what happens with all of this is it's affecting the brain wiring. And, and Ivy was was talking about that, and that's you know how you get some of the uh, rad behaviors is the neurological wiring has been affected. So if you think about the brain as your fist, and this is going to be very very simple. I'm not a neuropsychologist, so I have to keep it simple for myself. <laughs> um, but basically, the limbic system is your thumb, and it's tucked up inside, and then this is the cortex. So your eyes would be here, and here's the spinal cord. Um, the limbic system it operates at a subconscious level, and it's much faster than the cortex. It's in a primi more primitive part of the brain, so it's going to arrive on the scene faster than conscious processing is. Part of the limbic system is the amygdala, which is the danger detection system that we were talking about earlier. And so if that danger detection system gets activated, it sets off the fight or flight response. And Ivy was talking about that as well. So that's when, um, are people familiar with the fight or flight response? Yeah, mm -hmm. so all those physiological changes happen in the body to gear up to deal with the danger. So you get the adrenaline release, the heartbeat uh, beating faster, all of that. There's a physiological change when it gets activated and all of that helps you to deal with the danger. Um, and then the system, you deal with the danger, and then the system calms down again. Um, there is no free choice in the limbic system. Choice requires this part of your brain, you know, where you evaluate <coughs> options. If you're really in a dangerous situation, that is too slow. If you encounter a grizzly bear, you don't have time to use your cortex. You've got to react immediately. So the limbic system works great in an actual dangerous situation. The problem is misinformation can get stored in the limbic system. And the, the first year and a half of life, really it's just the limbic system that's operating. The cortex is not fully online yet. So all of those early childhood experiences are stored in the limbic system. And I think of it kind of as limbic rules. And you won't find this anywhere in the, lim the literature, I don't think, because it's just a term that I use that helps me make sense of it. Um, we all have these limbic rules. And the closer they are to reality, the more functional they're going to be. The further from reality, the less functional. But I think this is what happens with a lot of the parents that we see, is they've got some maladaptive things stored in their limbic system. And the limbic system is getting triggered and it's going into fight or flight response. If it goes into fight response, you know, if their child does things that trigger their limbic system, they go into fight mode with their child. Their body is telling them, stop that 
danger. And that's what they do. Um, and at that point, they're not really thinking of their child as their child. It's the danger that they have to stop. So like some of the maladaptive things that can get stored in the limbic system. Close relationships are dangerous. And I think that's part of what gets stored with kids with reactive attachment disorder because their experience has been when somebody gets close to you, you get hurt. Um, so you want to protect yourself from that. So flee, so that's what you see some of the kids doing, is they, they just avoid close relationships. Or some kids go more into fight mode. So if you're going to get close to me, I'm going to go into fight mode and I'm going to push you away because it's too dangerous to have people be close. Um, being emotional, that can trigger a limbic system. The rule might be it is not okay to express emotion uh, because maybe you grew up in a household where if you cried, you got smacked. So, um, and, and some of these rules can generalize. So it might just be don't show sadness, but it could generalize to it is not safe to feel sad. But even if you're not showing it, just starting to experience it internally, the internal experience of sadness triggers the limbic system. Um, vulnerability, that can be one. That being vulnerable is dangerous. Um, somebody might have grown up in um, a home like that, that if you show any sign of weakness, you're going to get hurt. <coughs> so that generalizes as a rule of any sign of vulnerability is not okay. And so that could be that if the child shows vulnerability, it triggers the parent's limbic system. And actually, what they're trying to do then is protect the child in this paradoxical way. Because the child starts to act vulnerable and the parent feels, oh my gosh, that's dangerous. Stop it. Make him stop that. Um, and do that through whatever means. And if it's a backhand to get him to stop it, then that's, that's what happens. Um, that's how a lot of this stuff gets transmitted generationally. Our limbic systems talk to each other. So parents don't sit down and tell their kids, being vulnerable is dangerous. It's not how it gets transmitted. It gets transmitted through the experience. And a lot of this, like I said, is in the first um, couple of years of life. I think it's very useful. The more we know about our own limbic systems, it's just useful in everyday life if you start looking at what rules am I operating by? Because like I said, you know, we all have them in the families that we grew up in. And, and dangerous, in terms of the limbic system, it, it's very general. Really what it is is do I approach it or do I avoid it? So if I approach it, you know, it's something that's safe that I want to move toward. Um, if it's dangerous, I want to, to move away. So some of the rules that, you know, kids are operating by, what they're trying to do is to be close. Um, but they've learned strategies of, you know, um, maybe my best bet is approach strangers. Um, and, and this is a big red flag for me when I'm doing a relationship assessment. And I look at the parent and child and I'm watching their inter interaction. And then if, if I walk into the room and I'm a stranger to the child and the child comes to me, huge, huge red flag when it's a very young child. Because the strategy that that child is using is my best bet to be safe is to go to a stranger. Um, and you know, sometimes people have a hard time with this because when I bring that up, it's like, well, so what? So the kid came to you. So what? You know, you're a nice lady. What's the problem with that? You're not dangerous. It's like, yeah, but the child doesn't know that. <laughs> I'm a stranger. The child has absolutely no idea of whether I'm safe or not. And so for them to choose to come to me, I mean, what you want to see is a stranger comes in and the child kind of moves closer to the parent because their model is my parent is safe. Strangers are dangerous, so I'm going to be careful about them and I'm going to go close to my parent and I'm going to watch what my parent does because my limbic system is in tune to hers and I pick up is it dangerous or or not dangerous 
Um, and it's all backwards then. Okay, so I raised a child that had ADHD, like extreme. And he possesses every single thing that you would say was rad. So how do you differentiate which is, I mean, he would go right up to you right now and start your lap. Some of the, that's a very good point. I mean, that you want to be careful about that and, and sort of observe in in different situations. I mean, is it just impulsivity that he just, or right. especially, you know, if I've got a toy that he's going right. to gonna come toward me. So you want to watch and see how consistently does that happen. You also get with, and, you know, as CASAs, you shouldn't be doing that evaluation. Right. Um, so it's more just kind of being alert for those kind of things. Are there some red flags going up? So it would be a red flag of, you know, let me sort this out a little bit more of what this is about and whether it's about impulsivity or whether it's about this world view. Because um, some of that is, I mean, you know, then if you see that the child is, is struggling with something, who do they go to? Mm -hmm. Because I would think, you know, an ADHD child is probably going to go to mom to help. Mm -hmm. The majority of time. <laughs> If they're standing closer to a stranger, you know, maybe they might, or they might not even be processing who's there, and it's just sort of like, help me, and I'm expecting I somebody to. I don't know that he wouldn't tell him everything. I don't know that he wouldn't completely go in the corner and not want to talk to anybody. You know, you just never know his behavior for that moment. Some of that, that sounds a lot like that. It does. You know, part of it with this, with, with Rad also, like when that child came to me, she was upset. So she was upset and she was crying, and that's a time... When that happens, the, the um, attachment system is activated. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know, we do the strange situation test, because it activates the child's attachment system. The parent leaves, and it's turned on. And so then you see when the system is activated, what do they do? And so my guess would be when that happens with an ADHD child, they're going to go to their attachment figure. So th that's, I mean, because of the limbic system, I think that that is a method by which you get these generational patterns. It also helps you understand what these parents are trying to change, because it seems simple. Stop hitting your kid. Easy. Um, it's why I think sometimes some of the anger management programs might not be um, totally effective when they're just teaching the, the skills of what to do and they're not dealing with the limbic system getting triggered. When the limbic system gets triggered, again, you're not using the cortex. It's fight or flight mode. So you're just acting to protect yourself. And in those situations, those skills that you've learned that are in your cortex aren't available. So part of this for parents is um, learning to figure this out about what are my triggers. The more you know what your triggers are, the more you can um, anticipate that. Um, I talk with clients about um, some of them have overactive limbic systems. And it's like having um, a car alarm that is overly sensitive, that it's too finely tuned. So you get within 20 feet of it. It's saying danger, 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 danger. And if you have a limbic system like that, you need to know it goes off and it's a false alarm. And when it goes off, I need to sort out, is this a true alarm or a false alarm? So that's what some of the parents have to be able to do is sort that out. Are they capable of doing that? It, it depends. Themselves? You know, and that's what I want to do is move on to circle of security because I think this parenting program provides a way of parents being able to, to get at that. Do you want to get your handouts out? It's this one. And a, a lot of the parents now are going through the Circle of Security program. It's an eight-week program. Evolution Services does it. I think there's some other folks. So this is... Word does it, too. Say it again. Word, Word does it. Okay. Um, I think it's handy to know this. And if you have the opportunity to go through it yourself, I think it's great um, that everybody can benefit from it. So essentially, secure attachments are formed in the format of this circle. And on the top of the circle, you have kids going out into the world and exploring. And on the bottom of the circle, they're coming back in and getting their cup filled up, their nurturing cup. And I think you can see it easiest with toddlers because they go out and they come back in and touch base 
and go out and come back in. So they're kind of doing a lot of this. Babies actually do it and, and you know, they, they, they look at you and they look away and they look at you and they look away. And so it's happening very, very quickly with babies. It's more subtle. So toddlers, it's the easiest to see it with. Adolescents, though, do it also. They just go out. They spend more time out on the top, but they still come in on the bottom. Sometimes it's tricky seeing when they come in because it's a subtle cue. They don't come and sit in your lap like, you're, like, like a toddler might. So and it talks about on here the things that parents need to do on the top of the circle and the things they need to do on um, the bottom. There's a, and, and this is what we were talking about, about um, setting, setting limits like the parents need to do on the top, promoting kids, um, being independent and setting some limits, and then also doing the nurturing piece. And we tend to have a preference that it's easier for us as parents the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle. And so we have to kind of work to expand the part of the circle that's not so comfortable for us. So the parenting program, it gives parents an opportunity to think about that, of where do I struggle? And so you'll hear parents talk about, I struggle on the top of the circle or I struggle on the bottom of the circle. And that's what they're talking about. If they struggle with letting their kids go out into the world and explore, or if they're struggling with being able to provide that nurturing. Because what happens, like on the bottom of the circle, if a, if a child comes in and they're needing their cup filled and a parent doesn't know how to do that, what they do is give them signals of, essentially, it's talking to the limbic system, of it's not safe to be down here, go back out and sends the child back out. And then it's difficult to form a secure attachment when the bottom half of the circle can't be completed. There's a very nice almost mantra that's taught that's down here, always be bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind. Um, whenever possible, follow my child's need. <coughs> whenever necessary, take charge. So it's this idea of, you know, when you follow, when they're out on the top of the circle and, and you're just following their lead because they're out there exploring and you let them do that and not hover and supervise too closely, um, but when they need you to be there to, to take charge. Um, they talk about the bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind. It's like a, a teeter-totter. So on one side, you have bigger, stronger. So it's you know being able to set limits and be in charge. The other side is kind. And wise is the fulcrum on which it tips, where you decide, is this a situation that's calling for me to be bigger and stronger, or is it one that's calling for me to be kind? And you want to balance, and, you, and, and a parent needs to be able to do both. And here again, you know, parents have preferences of it's easier for me to be bigger and stronger or it's easier for me to be kind. So you'll hear parents talk about that of um, I'm kind of heavy on the bigger and stronger or I really struggle with the being bigger and stronger. That's hard for me to do. Um, I'm going to show the DVD now. Can I have help? Getting this loaded. This is, um, you'll hear parents talk about the shark video or in, um, their shark music, hearing their shark music. To help explain this, we all want our children to feel secure with us. Unfortunately, good intentions don't. Okay. watch a replay of the exact same beach with one simple change. It's talking to your limbic system.
Did you notice how the background music changed how you felt about the speech? In the same way, our past experiences are the background music that shape how we feel about each of the needs on the circle. So I think this is a wonderful way to illustrate to parents about when they hear that scary music. So you'll hear parents talk about um, my shark music. I hear my shark music when my child won't listen to me because I grew up and that was wrong and that was bad and you always listen to your parents. And so it sets off their shark music for them. In other words, their limbic system is activated. They're feeling like it's a dangerous situation. And so I think it's a really nice way to get parents to think about it. It doesn't talk about the limbic system or anything. I think that might confuse a lot of the parents. But that's essentially what's going on, that it's a way for them to get deeper down into it. So you're not just looking at here parenting techniques. This is how you do a timeout, or this is how you do this or that. It's, it's looking at, because a lot of these parents know that they've done a lot of the parenting classes and they know these things. That's not what's getting them in the way. And if you talk with them, they can tell you, a lot of them, some of them can't, the right things to do. But they have trouble doing it in the situation because this stuff is getting activated for them. Um, you know, they, and, and this gives a way to think about, um, you know, like for parents who were abandoned or rejected, their child going out on the top of the circle can feel to them like my child is rejecting me and their shark music is set off. And that can make them pull their child back in or they can retaliate of, well, if you're going to leave me then, if you're rejecting me, then I'm going to leave you, and so I'm going to withdraw from you. Um, kids coming in on the bottom, some parents that sets off their shark, it feels overwhelming. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble taking care of myself. I have all of these unmet needs, and now you want from me? You want to stick your straw in me and suck me dry? Um, <laughs> And, and, and then it feels to them what they experience is their child is being mean to them. It feels aggressive. Or manipulative. Or manipulative. Yeah. You know, she's just trying to use me. And, um, and that's what it feels like to them, that their child is... I, I think um, it's important for maybe some of us here that you explain... I mean, I've experienced some of those feelings. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, sure. But I think it's about degrees. Right. You know, and being able to, I mean, I've had days where I've sat there and she's come back and I'm like, oh my God, she is sucking the life out of right. me. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like at this particular moment, whatever right. it is. It's at this particular right. moment where it's a problem is oh every God. time. <laughs> Pardon? What was that? I said, well, it sounds like she has affect, but like, so she can control it. That's probably what you're thinking, but you're not acting on it. Maybe, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we you all, like, mm. everybody, you know, if you go through the circle of security class, it raises some anxiety because it's like, oops, oh, done that one, done that one, done that one. Um, because we're not perfect. You know, we're going to struggle someplace. And, you know, what we know, though, if we can figure this out, if I have a harder time on the top or the bottom, it gives us an idea of probably if I'm compromised, where I'm going to be making mistakes is on the part of the circle that I have a hard time with. So if I'm sick, if I'm tired, if I'm hungry, if I'm stressed, I'm going to have to be particularly careful because I'm going to have trouble on the top or the bottom, wherever we tend to struggle. Organizing how you're looking at things, too, of, it, um, wow, it looks like this parent is kind of having a hard time on the, on the top. Um, and that might be something, you know, that then you can um, talk about. Uh, and they'll set particular objectives like at Evolution Services about, you know, that they're doing the circle of security class and they've talked about the top of the circle and these things and the parents identified, I have a hard time with this, so this is an objective for me during this visitation is I want to be working on this area. Um, 
and really, you know, why I'm presenting it to you, it, it's not so much for you to die, it, it's not to diagnose parents or things like that, but more um, people are using this language a lot. So you'll hear it in treatment team meetings about um, what are you doing with your sharp music? How's the sharp music going? You know, wh what's happening on the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle? So you understand what's, what are they talking about? They're not talking about JAWS. Okay. Yep. Yeah. They're going through what they're experiencing, what the requirements mean that they're trying to meet, what they, okay. Right, and if they're talking about it's sharp like music, that's not a bad thing. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're really, we're out of time. But the, this other form, if it, the, in look, observing, visitations and uh, looking at the cir circle of security every time there's a visitation at evolutions for example this is a form they use and you can take a look at that but you can see that it's it's a uh, it's really goal oriented they speak with the parents beforehand and what they're looking at and what they're working on then they go through the visit and they're observing that and then they evaluate after how they do what you know what worked what didn't work uh, setting goals for the next the next meeting so it's really a, a well thought out process along with just what you're saying mm -hmm. the evolution is where this is, uh takes place the uh training the well circle wait we, we had a casa that was that wanted to do this but uh, well several and they said they they couldn't allow it for for um, confidentiality reasons because the parents are involved in it uh, well, no, I'm just asking if the, the place where this is done, is that what yeah, that evolution that's, place is? Yeah, that evolution okay. and that word that kept it. Uh, so, the, but I don't know if adult ed sometimes? Adult ed, Glennis Carney has offered it through um, adult ed, you know, Emma Dickinson. Um, and it's really, she does it there also. So she's a good contact person if you want to take it. And like through adult ed, it is... Um, it's just the material, so it's not a discussion group. When they do this at Evolution Services, it's a discussion group, so parents can process. Um, and the one at Red Willow, I think she does it for professionals. So it's really to expose you to the material so you um, understand what it is people that you're working with are, are learning and what model they're using. Thank you very much. For Thank, you. Thank you.